webinar for Leachman Cattle. We're coming up to our bull sale um, a week from tonight or from today. Actually, the female star sale would be just six days from now. And uh, tonight we're going to be talking with a group of seed stock and commercial producers about the selection for profitability. And we're really fortunate to have a, a great group on tonight. We're going to open up with our seed stocks section where Craig Hayes and Bart Jones and Donald Brown are going to walk through how they use the indexes, dollar profit and dollar ranch and dollar feeder for their breeding programs. And then we've got a, a great set of commercial producers. Michael and Stephanie Knight are with us. Travis and Sarah Snowden are with us. And Sawyer Orr is uh, also going to be on the program. And we're going to talk about using um, Inherit and <coughs> DNA tools and, and the indexes to select commercial herds. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited about this. I'm, I, I mentioned to people that I'm at a technology <coughs> summit for agriculture in San Francisco tonight or today. And uh, people were asking me what I was the most excited about for innovation. And it is the ability of us to characterize so many traits and, and, and accurately characterize them with a big database and put genomics to work in that, and then roll all that information into models that allow us to balance the selection for profitability. And, and I do think we're in a unique time in history in that we're, we're moving our cattle better, we're moving them faster, and, and in a way that's going to have fewer grave unintended consequences, if you will. I think, I think if, we, if we roll back to where we were in genetic selection in the 80s, I think with the advent of EPDs and sire testing, a lot of us were really excited. We're going to make cattle way better. And we did. We made them grow faster and we made them get bigger, but we had some unintended consequences of all that. And some of it was that we have over time lost some of the maternal function of these cattle. And now today we have better tools than ever to, to look at an animal and say, here's an animal that's going to do really great at the maternal function. Here's an animal that's going to do really great at the growth and carcass and more terminal traits. Here's an animal that does pretty well at all of it. And, uh, and it is our ability to do that and do that accurately that's going to create less mistakes. And we all know in, in livestock production that it's the mistakes that cost us a lot of money, right? We, you know, we, we um, build the, uh, the, the, the wind shelter in the wrong place and a big storm blows in and, and catches our cattle drift in the wrong way. And it's, it's those kind of things cost us a lot of money. And uh, so we're excited about our ability to make better genetic decisions. And that's what we're going to talk about. I'm going to go ahead and uh, start us with a blessing. And then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Craig and his group to uh, talk about seed stock selection. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Uh, I thank you, especially, Lord, for uh, giving us this occupation that we love. I think every one of us gets up every day and we, we love what we do. We love to work with the animals. We love to care for the land. We love to have the opportunity to do so with our families. And uh, Lord, we thank you because we, we know that these gifts are from you. And uh, I want to especially thank you, Lord, for the, the, the technology that we have today. I, I, I no doubt in my mind, Lord, that, that you reveal these technologies to us, these ideas that we have about using genomics and selecting cattle. These aren't ideas from us, Lord. You tell us in Scripture that all good things come from you. And so we, we trust in these things from you, Lord, and we thank you for them, and we thank you for the chance to do what we love, and we pray that we would do it and bring honor and glory to your name, Lord. And so we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you folks for joining us online in person <laughs> and also uh, via Facebook Live and all these kind of things. I'll turn it over to you guys, Craig, so uh, you guys can uh, can talk about dollar profit for the next 30 minutes, and then uh, then we'll move into our commercial section. All right. Sounds great. Thanks, Lee. Great intro, and we appreciate it. It is a blessing to be here with all of you guys. And um, I'm glad you're able to join us here tonight. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And um, I'm going to kind of be responsible more for the seed stock side or the seed stock perspective of what we're going to talk about tonight. And as, as Lee said, he's going to lead here and just, um, you know, at the bottom, at the top of the hour here, he'll come back with um, kind of a commercial perspective and what's going on on that side as well. So, um, so we're going to talk about why we use dollar profit to breed better bulls. So sorry. 
breed better bulls, right, Lee? So, um, okay. Um, I was going to kind of do an icebreaker here tonight. Lee had a great intro to kind of using the indexes, why we use the indexes, and and, and how that balances balances out. And I think this next, um, this first slide I'm going to show you, I, hopefully you see how it does balance out. Um, here we go. Okay, so what makes up the indexes that we use? So we spent a little time this year and kind of broke broke down um, dollar profit, dollar ranch, and uh, dollar feeder to kind of see what traits actually go into those to make up um, um, those indexes. And I kind of thought it was really, really neatly how, how well dollar profit was kind of took a well-balanced approach here. Um, I guess I can, I'm going to break this out by, by, um, by index here real quick. I am going to move fairly quickly through these because we are a little short of time and want to get to some of the other talks as well. But I kind of want to just get us started on this. So um, if, you, if you look at this and I've kind of got it broke down, but um, you know, fertility is the number one trait by 1% um, in this, but marbling, energy utilization, growth, carcass weight and yield um, and retained heterosis. Are the, are the are the big six in dollar profit here, and um and, and there's several different traits wrapped into some of these. Um, we use um, uh, you know, dry matter intake, uh, cow size, um, so some other other things into energy utilization, kind of wrap those things together. Um, but just so you guys kind of know what what those are, of course, growth will be made up of um, anything from birth to birth to weaning weights, uh, birth to yearling or through carcass. Uh, carcass and yield would be more what, what we actually do um, 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 uh, hanging on the rail, what, what we get paid back. Um, hey, Russ, um, just had a text come in. Uh, we're not on Facebook Live as of yet. So um, I think I'll go ahead and continue, I think. Yeah, but, um, continue. I'm trying to get it on. OK, very good. Um, but. I think from you guys' perspective, you know, um, we, we sometimes just throw dollar profit at you and maybe you don't know what those means, but we put an economic weighting on each of these these traits and these individual segments. And that's the, that's the way we come up with um, dollar profit. So it's really, really nice to see how well balanced of approach that it gets. I'm going to move on to dollar feeder here. <clears throat> dollar feeder, <clears throat> maybe not quite so well balanced. Um, marbling, marbling does uh, is what pays on the grid. Um, we get our biggest premiums from that, especially when we get to the prime level. So we see that um, our, our second and third um, numbers are, are weightings that we put on there for growth and conversion. Um, so post weaning gain and and just uh, intake or, or feed feed conversion. And then again, our carcass weight and yield, and then retained heterosis comes in as a pretty small portion of, at this mode. Um, again, if you guys have questions as we're going through here, just ping or raise your hand, and, and Russ will kind of try to try to guide you through or, or, or get those questions related over to us. So, um, Dollar Ranch, um, again, maybe not quite as well balanced as um, as as um, Dollar Profit was. But we see here that um, cow fertility, we, we say fertility, but cow fertility is the number one trait um, here. As we've been through school, that's what we've always been told. Um, the researchers would say that. We've done some analysis here on our side to, to really break that out and see what the economic relevance is. But cow fertility, cow fertility um, affects your bottom line. And, and, and the number of number of calves or the percent calf crop weaned, the number of calves that you're able to sell at weaning, and that's what our cow fertility tells you. Um, it's related in, in the number of calves that cow would have in her lifetime um, and that gets to weaning. So um, the cow feed requirements is probably the, probably the second biggest thing. Is it's the number one um, feed or, or input value that we put into the cow herd at, at the ranch. Um, it's, it's not, it's not, um, um, we would probably think that retained heterosis falls closely behind that. That is our biggest impact that we can have as a, from a breeding standpoint on our cow fertility. That's how we can increase the cow fertility the fastest is through our retained heterosis. And probably the most interesting thing that I found um, on this slide is calf weight um, comes in at, at a distant fourth place um, at 12%. Um, these are economic analysis that that, that we've run on on these things, and um, 
you know, we've, we've over the years, we've really selected for, for increased growth rate, um, potentially at, at our expense, as, as Lee maybe even commented there in, in the intro, we've um, selected for cattle that, that do grow faster and at what expense. It's probably affected our fertility, our cow feed requirements, um, potentially even our, our retained heterosis. So the big three, we've probably affected that by selecting strictly for calf weight. Um, and then, of course, other and those others will be the carcass traits and other things that kind of fall in their birth weights and stuff like that. So um, I'm going to take a quick breather. I'm going to ask um, Russ, do you have any questions before we move on just on these indexes? Because we'll next we'll move into kind of kind of um, myself, my, my, my perspective, um, Donald Brown and Bart Jones is our perspective on how we use dollar profit to to improve the genetics of our of our seed stock hertz. Russ, you OK? Yep, everybody's good. OK. So um, I'm just going to tell you real quick, I'll, I'll try to be pretty brief about this and not take up these other guys' times. But just so you guys know, um, I'm Craig Hayes. I, I, I have a cow herd of my own back in Diagonal, Iowa, south, southwestern Iowa. Um, I was running Hayes Land and Cattle. I am a cooperator into the Leachman system here um, and was a dollar profit share customer um, before that time. But um, and then um, but currently I do work for the last five years. I work for Leachman Cattle Company um, as um, as the as a lead or as the director of the research and development and product um, the quality control of these cattle that go in and out of our go in and out of our system, work closely with our cooperator system as well. So kind of give you a, a quick understanding uh, of who I am. But I do have I do have a unique perspective, I think, to add to the system because I have a I have a um, perspective from the outside as well as from the inside. And I want to talk about it. Um, a couple of those things, maybe from the outside first. When I first started to look for dollar profit or, or why I joined dollar profit was I was looking for a system that gave me um, many of the EPDs uh, for a, a lot of the traits that the breed associations that I was working with probably weren't interested in or maybe not that they weren't interested in, but they had not collected much data on that. And just to, to mention a few of those, um, of course, the indexes at, that, that Leach and Cal has put together, we, we've kind of felt like before and now that they were the best indexes in the in the industry from a holistic approach. Um, feed intake data. Um, I collected a lot of feed intake data. I've collected feed intake data for about 15 years now. Um, so I was collecting feed intake data and none of the breed associations were working very closely with that. Um, scrotal measurements, mature weights, heights, body condition scores of those mature cattle. Um, udders and feet are also um, traits that we've we've um, added to this, and it's kind of been the only place you can go and get all of these. Um, many of the, the associations are kind of joining forces now or, or kind of trying to play catch up. And then, you know, in the last three years, we've added the cow fertility, and I'll maybe um, let Donald and, and um, Bart talk more about that, but many of us selected for stability. I'm not sure how much um, genetic improvement we made over the years with that, but we look forward to seeing where cow fertility takes us. I think it's kind of the economically relevant trait um, from that standpoint. Um, the second reason that I that I kind of came and, and joined um, joined um, Don Profit Share was I was interested in a system that wasn't dependent upon breed. I mean, many of our continental breeds accepted Angus as a as an alternative breed to bring into their systems, but if you wanted to bring Gelby, Gelby cattle and you wanted to add Semitol to the mix or you wanted to add South Devon or you wanted to add uh, Shorthorn or Hereford, um, that was not really accepted in those industries. So I was looking at, thing, at a system that would allow us to use whatever breed best fit the models that increased um, profit to the customers that we were selling bulls to at the time. So, And then, then the third perspective, point that I wanted to make was is kind of more of an internal perspective or it's maybe more a little bit looking backwards. But I, I was really interested um, and, and as, as as interested now looking back at this system in that um, the people that were putting the indexes together, the people that were um, putting the data out for us were not only just researchers and just maybe you could call us call them desk jockeys, but um, they were actually using um, Leachman cattle actually uses this data. Um, I tell many people, many people we used to have been told that <clears throat> Leachman just runs their own genetic evaluations and they make up the data to make it fit what they what they want it to. Well, I tell them if that's the case, we drink an awful lot of the Kool-Aid that we try to sell. So um, and as much that <clears throat> that we 
if you want to say that that, that that we we create these indexes and stuff, we use it to the betterment to, to make cattle better. And so I think it was a good thing that that not only we're the creators um, of, of the indexes, um, guided by science, of course, but that we use the data. And if we see it's not working, we're going to want to change that for the betterment for our commercial customers. So um, those are the, those are the thoughts that I had for, for um, why we use dollar profit to build better cattle here in, in this talk. And hopefully we have a little different perspective from each of our um, our speakers here tonight. So with that, without any questions, I'm going to move on to um, uh, Mr. Donald Brown. Um, he's of the R.A. Brown Ranch in Throckmorton, Texas, kind of north central Texas. Um, Donald and his family sell Red Angus, Angus cattle and Sim Angus bulls through two annual um, um, bull and female sales each year um, and involved in a lot of different aspects of the beef cattle industry. Um, he has a unique perspective. He's probably been with us one of our longer dollar profit share customers at approximately 10 years. So, um, Donald, if you will um, join in and share with us, we'd appreciate it. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here with the group tonight. And I am a huge fan of dollar profit. And I'm a fan of dollar profit because of several reasons. One is it helped add more tools to my toolbox. Uh, Craig, you mentioned that a little bit with the more traits that we have. And so I'm one of those guys that I want as many tools as I can to help me select the best cattle for my business. And it is absolutely a business that is how our family makes our living. And it has helped us tremendously to improve profit. And that to me is essential as our number one goal is to improve the profitability and the sustainability in the beef business for our customers. Dollar profit helps us do that. Lee mentioned in the beginning that, yeah, EPDs in the early days did definitely help us increase growth rate, but with that increased cost of production. What I love so much about dollar profit is it, it looks at both sides of the profit equation. In addition to looking at the income side of the equation with how many pounds we have to sell and how much marbling and therefore how many valued pounds that we have to sell, it also looks at the cost side of the profit equation. How many pounds of feed are those cattle eating every day? How efficiently are they converting those pounds? What about some of those other traits like pulmonary artery pressure, uh, mature size, things that make a big difference, tools that we have not had in the toolbox before. And now with genomic enhancement, with DNA, mm -hmm. the accuracy is tremendous. So I'm a big fan. And, and what I've learned in the coming on 10 years that we've been part of the dollar profit system is that I needed Goldilocks cows. Not too big, not too small, but just right. Cows that fit my environment, that were efficient at not only converting feed, but also converting pasture to better utilize the, the, the resources that we have on the ranch. Another thing I learned, and I, I never dreamed I would get here because, man, I grew up raising Simmental and Sim Angus cattle, and I, we were all about more pounds, more performance, more growth, more pounds to sell. And I never thought we would get to a point where we had too many pounds. But there's no doubt we've come to a place where we've got cows bigger than what the resources on our ranch can sustain. And to improve our sustainability, and our profitability, we can do that with cows that eat less and produce more quality pounds that pay and do it more efficiently with better fertility. And to me, those are the key essentials of fertility on the ranch. I'm confident that in our industry today, we have made cattle that have a big enough engine that when we put them on the racetrack in the feed yard where they have all the nutrients they need, they can perform like crazy. But I think we hit a glass ceiling with some of these high engine, high performance cattle on the ranch that we're not able to achieve all the genetic potential that those cattle can gain because they just don't have enough environment on the ranch. 
I liken it to a race car that can go 200 miles an hour compared to a pickup. My pickup can go just as fast, if not faster, on ranch terrain, ranch terrain, as that race car can. Now, because I'm working on the ranch, my cows are on the ranch, and that's where my business is. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to produce the best carcass possible, the most efficient feeder cattle possible. But I also want, I, I've got to make sure that I get maximum return to the ranch. And so I'm seeing that there's no need to pay for the ultra high growth cattle if I'm selling calves at weaning time because I just don't have the environment to capture that. But those are my thoughts as we, we talk about it. I'm a huge fan of heterosis. I'm a believer in planned crossbreeding system. All of those are built into the dollars profit system. And so I, I'm a huge fan and appreciative that I have the opportunity to work with these tools. Okay. Donald, thank you, thank you, thank you for your perspective and um, your unique perspective here after being on here for 10, 10 years as well. So, hey, I'm gonna take a quick break. Hey, for those of you, it sounds like we're not on Facebook Live yet or haven't been. If you're unable to be on Facebook Live, if you are turn now. To, okay, I'll just go ahead and say this though anyway, but on page four, there is a QR code. Um, if you scan that Q QR code, you can be live on our Teams meeting, and that'll take you directly to that if you're having any trouble with that. So um, we'll go ahead and go on to, to um, Bart Jones. And um, Bart Jones um, and his family um, work with uh, Red Hill Farms located in the hills of northern Tennessee and, and southern Kentucky. They're right on the line there, a beautiful place. Um, it's a family operation. He runs out with his wife, Sarah, and son, Ty, along with his parents, uh, Dr. Gordon and um, Susan Jones. Um, these guys are also selling Red Angus, Sim Angus, Charlay, and a unique cross called tie, uh, Cross Tie Bulls um, through uh, two annual production sales on, on their, their operation. Um, Bart, Bart and the family in Red Hill Farms has joined us as Dollar Profit Share customers for two years and um, have a really unique perspective of indexes, potentially over 40 years. Um, they also have raised hogs on the side too, and the hog industry was early adapters of these indexes. And so they know how these indexes work and, um, and, and have joined us to kind of do that in their, in their beef cattle, cattle herd as well. So Bart, I'm gonna turn it over to you and uh, for your perspective, please. Thank you, Craig. I really appreciate the opportunity to be on tonight and um, the dollar profit share is the best investment my family's made. Um, I like to uh, second what Donald said about all the tools that are in the toolbox. But one of the most important things that I like about the dollar profit is the simplicity that it brings to my customers. Um, basically, dollar profit, dollar ranch, dollar feeder. What more do you want to look at? Why get confused with all those uh, tools in our toolbox, and I'm thankful for all those, but I really appreciate the simplistic approach uh, that we get from the dollar from those three indexes. Um, it's simple to understand and it's easy to teach our customers uh, what to select for using those indexes. Uh, we believe in the index selection and the progress that we can make and uh, certainly excited about what dollar profit is doing for us and one of the reasons that we're, we really enjoy being part of Dollar Profit is the accuracy of the data and the integrity and um, common goals of all the Dollar Profit share customers and the Leachman cooperators. Uh, this is a group of serious cattlemen that are in the business to uh, uh, with similar goals. And uh, unlike... Uh, where we come from breed associations and maybe people have alternative goals, but in this group of dollar profit share members and the Leachman cooperators, everybody has the same end goal. And we certainly appreciate that about this system. At Red Hill over the years, we've uh, uh, focused on the cow first and keeping the cow size down moderate cows that wean a high percent of their body weight and have uh, relative, you know, have small inputs. And uh, that's been a, a major thrust and focus of our breeding program and something that our customers have come to not only expect, but appreciate. 
and uh, when we joined the dollar profit system, it was amazing how the dollar ranch ranked our cows. And uh, we kind of came on board the same time that the fertility uh, values came out. And uh, we sit back and we study the cow herd and we study those values and sit back and say, wow, how can we, uh, how can we do such a good job? And uh, so we have tremendous confidence in the fertility uh, values that Leachman's putting out. And uh, we really think it reflects uh, what our cows are doing. And, uh, and the dollar ranch is just a tremendous tool to uh, increase, increase our production without increasing our cost. And our customers have bought into that very well. Um, just like Donald said, we're extremely happy about the added toolbox that we have by using dollar profit, uh, PAP, feet, udder, mature weight, height, yearling height, mature height, are all things that we've measured for years, just like Craig mentioned when he spoke, that most that data just basically set in our computers and never was used. And uh, it's great to see that data being used going into the dollar profit system and generating results. And then the most exciting thing with the dollar profit share is that the dollar profit share, basically this genetic evaluation powers the Zoetis Inherit program. And that's a, the genet, genomic testing of commercial heifers has been the biggest game changer that I've seen in the genetics business for my commercial customers in the last, in my lifetime. And uh, it's a, our customers are absolutely, they, the first year they test their yearling heifers or their keeper heifers. And before you know it, they're collecting DNA on all their calves at the first processing so that they can make the best selection decisions that they can. They actually have now the same tools to make selection that I have as a purebred breeder and a member of Dollar Profit Share. And uh, we've had a tremendous buy-in by our customers. And that's probably, that's worth more to me. Uh, probably the biggest positive of Dollar Profit Share is the Zoetis Inherit testing. With that, we just say thanks and we're great, uh, very grateful to be a part of Dollar Profit and appreciate all the leadership from Lee and his whole team in giving us this opportunity. All right. Thanks, Bart. Lee, if that wasn't a, a great intro into the um, into the next segment, but um, we, I guess we should ask to see if there's any questions. Um, I guess I could, while well, Russ is checking on that, I could say that um, these guys, these are not paid advertisements, Lee. Um, um, they actually pay us to, to, to work with them. And I say that jokingly, guys. I, we, we, we appreciate your business and, and thank you that, that you appreciate what we do for you as well. But, um, but, the, but those are great, great comments. I hope, hope that helps you guys understand um, what we do, but also you know, what our partners do as well and, and how it's impacting um, the bulls that we're hopefully preparing for you and, 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 and then the upcoming sale here next weekend too. So Lee, I think we can turn it over to you, let you move on with the um, commercial aspect of this. You betcha. Thank you guys. And I, I think for those of you that are watching the program that maybe are less familiar with dollar profit, um, it, I think it bears saying that uh, the data that drives our analysis with Zoetis that, that's behind the inherit selection comes from um, a group of seed stock breeders that obviously include Ari Brown Ranch and Red Hill Farms and about uh, in all about 100 other breeders primarily no located here in North America. We've got a few in Australia and New Zealand. We've got um, a, a fair slug of stabilizer breeders in the UK and then and then our cooperator network. And, and these breeders, as, as Bart said, are very like-minded and they contribute data. And the data that comes in now is approximately 30,000 seed stock animals a year. And uh, we're accumulating genomic tests quite rapidly. We've got uh, about 125,000 of these seed stock animals now tested genomically. And uh, the database is effective because of breeders that are on this program tonight, like Donald and Bart, that 
are are collecting data are very serious about collecting data uh, you know in the seed stock business there's a lot of skepticism of people that that maybe turn in data to help sell seed stock um the the, the breeders in our system really as my dad told me when I was young, he said, the day you turn in fake data, he said, the first person you fool is yourself. He said, because you'll make bad breeding decisions yourself. And uh, that's, you know, I think that's the philosophy that drives the group is that we're about breeding better cattle for ourselves and for our customers. And the data we turn in really helps us do that. And if we don't turn in good data, it doesn't work. And I think that's been the thing that if I, if I could say if, if Zoetis was on the call with us today, they'd say that's maybe one of the things that was pleasantly surprised them about the database is is how accurate and and how useful the predictions are, and it's because of breeders like this that are that are working on it. So thank you guys for for joining us tonight. Um, now we're we're going to transition over and and talk about the the commercial side, and uh, we've got three different operations represented on the line tonight, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves and just tell you a little bit about their operation. And uh, we'll start out with uh, you, Michael and Stephanie. Why don't you just tell people where you're from and a little bit about your cow-calf operation. I'm going to speak for us. Um, I think my Great. dad might be back on, but I'm not sure. Um, but we're located in Gauls, Texas, just outside of College Station. Um, we just have a, a commercial um, Angus Cross uh, cow calf operation. Um, we're running about <clears throat> about 120 head now. We're we're still growing, and um, you know we've been real excited about the bulls that we've purchased over the last few years um, from Leachman and and how they've improved our our genetics. They've improved our um, calves and our weaning weights, and it's it's just been um, really good for us um, and just improving everything overall. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for, for joining us. I'll go um, next to you, Sawyer, if you, Sawyer Orr, if you would uh, introduce yourself and your operation for folks. Yeah, I'm Sawyer Orr. I'm located in northwest Nebraska in the Panhandle, uh, primarily south of Crawford, that area. Um, I run roughly 80 to 100 head give or take every year and i guess i i raise stabilizers now <laughs> i that's that's what i do um it it start didn't start out that way but here i am and and loving it that's a great that's a great story so I'll, I'll have to share with you sometime that uh, the breed was really born by a visit that i made to uh to a ranch uh, owned by Pat Vinton south of Gordon one time. And uh, it was that visit to that ranch and looking at how well those composites did on Sandhills grass that convinced Lee Leachman that composites were the way to go. So, um, and uh, so now we'll, we'll jump over um, Travis and Sarah Snowden, if you guys would introduce yourselves and where you're from and tell us a little bit about your operation. Russ will take you off mute, I think. Or maybe you guys have to do that. There you go. Okay, perfect. You bet. Great. Yes, Travis and Sarah Jane Snowden. We're located in northwestern Colorado. Our program consists of about 700 mother cows um, with very English based Simmental, Angus, Hereford. And we try to cross everything we have on uh, our, your stabilizer bulls, Lee. And we, we love the cross. It has proven itself time and time and time. We've been in the program for probably five years now. And it is, I mean, there's no turning back for sure. Great. I'd like um, each of you to, to give some thought to kind of what your goals are right now and, and what you're trying to improve. And, and we'll uh, bounce around in order just so, so well, that, that's hard. And if then nobody knows whether they're going to, how about we go in the same order again and again, then everybody knows when their question's coming. I think that would be less stressful for you and for me so that's good so we'll start out stephanie and, and just tell us what what you guys are are working on right now in your herd and i'll say to the later speakers there's nothing wrong with repeating because might be you guys have common goals but but as you as you look at it stephanie what are you guys what are the top two or three things you're working on um i'd say top a couple of things would be um just improving um like our maternal you know our fertility um, having good calf crops 
and then um, improving our our weaning weights and uh, you know the the vigor of our calves and that's already shown in the last um, you know we've been doing this for five or six years I think that we've been um, buying the stabilizer bulls and we definitely you know last year we had a couple of, of calves that we sold over 700 pounds and and that was really nice and I know we're going to have several more this year because they're really looking good and so that's that's what we've been trying to do just just increase our, our calving crop and we've been able to you know with the I know we'll get to it but the the DNA they inherit you know being able to to find those that are going to have more of that <clears throat> maternal ability and then you know having those those uh larger calves that's great that's great Sawyer you want to dive in next on on what your goals are with your cow herd well I guess it started out with uh harnessing heterosis at the easiest way possible um coming out of college I was frustrated with uh trying to use EPDs across you know different breed associations you can't necessarily compare one to the other and it was difficult along with the management situations on maintaining F1 for maximum heterosis and that's kind of where I leaned into the stabilizers it was a plug and play easy way to to incorporate that and then uh, along those lines it kind of turned into reducing mature weight and I guess the one big number is you know, pounds of body weight waned per exposed female every year. I mean, that kind of encompasses the entire uh, cycle annually. And it, whatever you can do to increase that number, you're you're being more sustainable, more profitable. And it it turned into smaller cows. I they're producing very well. I think my my herd's averaging about eleven seventy five for a weight. And the past two years, I've been over 600 pounds pay weight on the the calves that went to the feedlot so i mean it's it's working and and cows are staying pregnant they're staying in the herd younger cows are out producing older cows i mean that's it's, everything's working great that's super you bet thank you for that so here i'll circle around and uh, ask you some questions about the forage base in the sand hills so you'd be thinking about that and that would be that'll be good um, Travis and and Sarah Jane, you guys want to go next? Talk about what well, your think, two or three main things are. Yeah, yeah, we we really try to boil it down and, and focus on the consistency of our weights for our calves and and just general quality of cattle. Uh, before we were in the program, we, we I just felt like we had too many sorts come fall when we're shipping. We had that that perfect punnet square of like the solid black calves and the the F1 Baldies and the true Hereford um, calves. And and I just wanted a more consistent calf base with reasonable weights and, and, and just really tried to focus on that carbon copy calf, whether it be a, a female or, or a steer. And that, that's really been our driving factor. Great, super. Um, I, I know in each of your environments, um, you, you face particular challenges. Um, I might, start with you travis then we'll roll back through sawyer and stephanie travis and and sarah jane is i mean what is 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 i mean i know you guys are at high altitude maybe people don't know that from the address you listed but maybe talk to us a little bit about the particular challenges of that environment to to raising cows and and what you're finding boy our cattle it is a rough environment up here and right now we still like like we talked lee we still have a couple feet of snow and they need to be big, hardy animals, um, hardy animals. I mean, we're we're definitely trying to get that more moderate cow, but they need to have pap scores. Uh, we really focus on that pulmonary arterial pressure, and, and that's, that's a big deal up here, and, and good feet. Yeah. I mean, they'll, they'll travel from 9,000 feet elevation uh, to, to lower hay meadows, but they really need to have good feet, good udders, and really, really, we focus on that pap score. Um, but that that's big deal in our area. Mm -hmm. Almost kind of a requirement for entry, isn't it? <laughs> oh, that it is. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, they leave in a less than desirable form. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Sawyer, I, I gotta say, the Sandhills, Nebraska, looks like a sea of grass for most of us. But uh, <clears throat> one of the big challenges there is cow body condition, isn't it? I mean, it's a it's a deceptive grass, isn't it, in a way? 
it is. There's a lot of it, and maybe quality isn't what you would believe it would be. I'm I'm actually in run my cattle in the Pine Ridge area. Okay. So it's it's yep. a lot shorter, shorter, harder grass, um, a lot rougher ground, but I will say it's better than sand hills. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I do know they have they have trouble with body condition because of washier grass. Uh, you know, a lot of cellulose, a lot of bypass and nothing. Um, for me, uh, the biggest thing is feet, feet and utter quality is is huge for me um like i'd say maybe similar to that would be not as enough um really choppy sandstone buttes and and heavy pine tree forests and ponderous pines and stuff and they they got to be able to travel it doesn't matter what they can do in the feedlot if them if them mama cows and them calves can't travel and gain weight out here in this rougher country and i that's that's my main concern i would say Mm-hmm. Oh, that's cool. Stephanie, what about in your country? I mean, obviously a very different climate than where these other guys are running cows. What, what's the biggest challenge where you are? Yeah, I think the biggest challenge is the summer in the heat and the droughts that we have. Sometimes it got pretty dry this summer and it got really hot. Yeah. And um, I, you know, when we first started buying these bulls coming from Colorado, I just, I just didn't know how they were going to handle this you know 100 degree 110 degree weather and they they held they held up fine they they acted like they they knew what they were doing of course we're not there you know we're not we don't have them out during that time <clears throat> we've already pulled them by that time and so um they're getting to recover so they're not out trying to chase cows uh during that heat but um they've held up good and I, i'd say that's that's the toughest part for us and then when it gets so dry and we're pretty good. We're pretty blessed with some good grass. My granddad took care of that, and we've continued to take care of that on our on our piece of property. Um, but you know, sometimes it still gets tough when it gets so dry. Yeah, no, for sure. Well, that's great. It's, it's interesting to hear the different perspectives. I said my father also. I have a lot of quotes from my dad. He said he said there's there's never easy country that people run cows on because. The easy country is being farmed. He said. So, <laughs> I think there's some truth to that. Um, so, as the the question I'm going to ask you next is kind of, I know each of you has done some testing with Inherit, and uh, I, I'd like you to speak to uh, what what you've learned from that, and and then sort of a follow up sort of question is maybe, what was the thing that surprised you the most in that data? Okay. And we'll just we'll just continue to kind of go around the circle. So I'll I'll ask that um, first of of you, Travis and and Sarah Jane, and then I'll we'll go to Sawyer and then to Stephanie. I think inherit really verified the genetic merit of our females. Um, we've learned that it's not necessarily those big broody females with perfect phenotypes that make the best cows. Um, they those. You know, I'm not saying that in general for everyone, but but they may get too large, milk poorly, or just cost you money, and and that's that's a that's an unnecessary operating cost that you have to eat, and it, it's really allowed us to to implement a far more uniform group of females into the herd um, from a very specific area within our our little bell curve, and thus gaining us a more focused type of cow base in our breeding program. And that, that makes it easier to manage them, doesn't it? I mean, we oh, all, that it does. Yeah. We all feed them and, and care for them to, to target kind of body condition. And if they're if they're widely divergent in their type and kind, it makes it hard to manage, doesn't it? S Sawyer, would you like to go next on that? Sure. Um, I'd say the three big things that I use inherit for is once again, selecting for, for good feet and good tip and composite. Those are the two tools to me. Um, and then after that, fertility. Um, fertility is huge. And I'd say on the surprise side, I would our cattle, I was very surprised on how fertile they were. Um, and I like to think that I had, it was because of just simply not tolerating open animals. They, they're gone. It didn't matter if they, you thought they looked good or or you thought they were doing you good. If, if they were open, they're gone. 
They, they just didn't get that second opportunity to fail. I mean, you're out. From what I figure, if they if they lose one calf or come up open one time, you're going to hold to the life by the time you figure out all the the costs go into them. So, um, once again, mature weight it was a big one for me, um, keeping a moderate flushing ability. And then, and I honestly, at this point, I feel like I have a lot of that in check. I'm very happy with where I am. And mm-hmm. I've started really leaning in towards the carcass side of things because I, I feel like a lot of people like spoken before trying to, to get growth, growth, growth. Um, we kind of forgot about the cow and, and you, you'll never have an exceptional bull on the seed stock side of things. If you're not, if you don't have an exceptional cow, it starts with the cow. In my opinion, it, it simply doesn't matter. And if you don't have that in place, you might as well stop. And so now I'm chasing carcass, trying to, to filter that in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's uh, I think it's always surprising uh, which animals excel on the different traits. It's a little hard to see it, right? I think Travis made the remark, you know, you, you got that big strap and heifer that you want to keep, but but if the system says she's not good at this or not good at that, and the surprising thing is that the the, the, the phenotype can fool us sometimes. Stephanie, I, I didn't give you a chance to go ahead, if you would, and talk about what you think you're learning from your inherit testing. Um, it w- It's the, kind of the same thing, learning that, you know, we can't just going off of looking at them. Um, we're we're going to call different ones looking at the data and kind of getting getting my, my mom and my dad on board with getting around to that that type of thinking. And so, uh, you know, we're really looking at the fertility and um, our second group of of leachman heifers, um, we got all of them. They were all bred. Um, you know, we had some some issues when it came down to calving, which you know you're going to have that f- from environment and this and that. But um, but they they were all bred. Um, we didn't have any open ones that we had to get rid of, and so that that made a big difference. And I'm hoping that we continue that trend. So that's one thing for sure that we've really been looking at. And then, um, and and just coming to terms with, you know, just looking at them, you know, I, I want to look at the data. I want to, you know, not just look at, at how they look and what what we think looks good. You know, sometimes we got to get rid of them if if they're not going to perform like we need them to. Mm-hmm. It, it, I'm so glad you brought that up, Stephanie, because I do think that um, it's hard. I think we have everybody on this on this webinar. I'm sure. Um, has has made their living by looking at them and, and selecting cattle. All of us in the seed stock business did. Those of you in the commercial did too, and and we were taught that by by our family or, or whomever we we got that information from, and it served us well. And and it's it's a hard thing to 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 depart from tradition when tradition has kept us in business, right? I mean that's that's just the reality of our industry. We've seen lots of people who haven't stayed in business and <laughs> we trust the traditions because they have kept us in business. And yet we, we have this tool that that can see things we can't see and, and trusting in that. I suppose it's kind of like a pilot who learns to fly on uh, on instrument rating at first. That when you If you've flown all by sight all your life and then you, you basically got to close your eyes and fly by instruments. But what we know is that those instruments are are better because there's a lot of stuff you can't see. Um, and I think that's the way this DNA is. Um, certainly for us, one of the things is, is, you know, when you pick those heifer calves at weaning time, we got to, you know, the, probably more than any time in their life, the variation in age is showing itself the most, you know. And, and what do we tend to do is pick those biggest oldest, right? And we miss those really good heifers that might be a born – you know, in the in the second 30 days of the season, because they don't look like those big firstborn heifers look. And and some of those firstborn heifers don't have as good a genetics as some of those others. And it's a it is a it is kind of a trial and error thing. I, I want to go back, Sawyer. I, I, I know that you commented that your um your profit your 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 fertility came out higher than you thought, but but I would say that this kind of knowing how you've selected sires over the years, you've always been very conscious about cow and maternal function and 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 mature size. Would that be accurate, Sawyer? Absolutely. Yep. 
that's well, from the beginning of using Leachman genetics would have been, oh, roughly eight, nine years ago, I suppose. Um, right out the gate, um, we we focused on Dollar Ranch over Dollar Feeder. We yeah. we prioritized it from the get go. Yeah. And it, it kind of landed us in a good spot when when we inherit come out. And that was probably a big player in our fertility numbers as well. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I think that's that's exactly right. I think that you know one of the things that that has happened, and and I think this is one of the reasons we ask you all to come on, is that is that those people that aren't using these tools, you know, you look at all those numbers, you say, gee, could that? How did they? How could they be right? You know, and uh, I tell people that that the best the best validation of the of the dna numbers are the breeders that have used them and seen them play out and uh we we just so appreciate you all coming on our our program to talk about that because at, at the end of the day um you know it, it is it is the breeders and I, I i talk to there's you know this large group of seed stock producers that turn in data and i know that uh as we look at those tools and and look at fertility and its ability to tell us which of those bulls are going to produce daughters that aren't going to stay in the herd, which is probably our all of our worst nightmares is because when we keep a, a heifer calf and then we get her bred as a yearling and she calves and then she doesn't rebreed, it's about the worst financial outcome we can have. It's just to put that money into that heifer and not kept her. And I, I think as we look at the seed stock herds that are recording the data, they see that this number is playing out. And I think in, in commercial herds, it's it's playing out as well. And I, I, I like to think that we're going to use a lot fewer bulls that, that I would call herd wreckers, right? The bulls that that the majority of the daughters don't stay. And and I and I would be the first to say we've all we've all used bulls like that. Um, some of them more recently than we want to admit. But this uh, technology now is going to give us an insight into that that we we didn't have before. Um, just to kind of um, take it to take it to the, the 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 next step and i think this is uh where you were going a little bit with your comments sawyer but i'd i'd be interested in in uh seeing how people combine these deals because we talked about like the important things um on the on the commercial side being the the ranch and the fertility and i think all three people echoed that but isn't it kind of surprising how you can find cattle that also have some carcass goodness in them that, that still have those numbers, right? Uh, that You want to comment on that, Sawyer? And then I'll, I'll go around to Stephanie and then to Travis again. So, Yeah, um, it, it's really neat. I, well, honestly, that ends up being, at this point in time, the the females that I'm keeping because it, like on my side, say they're capped on, you know, 25,000 on profit and 120 on ranch. I mean, I'm to the point now that, you know, my entire heifer crop is capped yeah. to the point that that that's I, I know they're good <laughs> that's all i know and and to get to get to that level i mean they have to be carrying that carcass merit and and uh, i guess that was marbling was was or the the balance between marbling and ribeye was astonishing in my cattle i didn't real, realize i had something like that going and i i feel like that's that's been a significant player in, in my personal success too yeah, that's cool. Stephanie, how, what about on your side? What are you seeing that, that you're able to to add to the mix that's that's kind of interesting in addition to kind of the core traits? Um, yeah, I think we've seen some some marbling um, <clears throat> traits that, you know, we weren't focusing on. So it was nice to see that it was there. And um, I will say we were, <laughs> it's probably not the right you know reason to use this but we had a, a few coals and we were trying to decide one to to butcher and i said well this one's got better marbling so let's <laughs> let's take that one you know choose that one so you know i used it even on our coals to <laughs> to choose which one that we <laughs> wanted to to process so um <clears throat> you know it's 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 nice to see that because it's not something that we focused on but um, but it's going to come, you know, it's going to come as we improve things. So I'll, I'll tell you a funny, a funny story goes along with that. Stephanie, my son, about the second year he was in 4-H, we picked a steer out that was an absolute orangutan on disposition, but he had really high dollar profit. 
and uh, we showed him. We barely got him through the show ring. I won't even go into that. But 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 he did put him in the carcass contest, and he won the carcass contest. He graded almost prime and was a yield grade one point five, and had a nine hundred pound carcass. And my son will say, "Well, this is easy, Dad. Let's just." Let's just DNA test him and pick the high dollar profit one. We'll win the carcass contest every year. And and for those of you on the call, this that strategy does work. Okay. So it's a it's a phenomenal <laughs> technology. And those those outliers on on the dollar feeder index and dollar profit, they they do make pretty unbelievable carcasses. So um, something to think about. Uh, Travis and, and Sarah Jane, as, as you guys um, look at your cow herd. Where do you see yourself a few years from now that's different from where you are today? If 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 I can ask where you, you know, where you see the opportunity for improvement. Because you get those percentile rank and and Travis, you were talking about the normal curve. About the time I get a rancher talking about the bell curve, I'm like, now here's a guy that's a little above average in terms of statistical thought process here. But uh, do do you use percentile ranks when you look at kind of how your herd is? Because that's one of the things you get back from from inherit they've got that kind of one to a hundred scale and and if you notice every once in a while one or two of those traits is ranked wrong i don't know Bart, if you guys have talked to your customers about changing that but they do have mature sizes biggest being a number one rank and i'm like i'm not sure that's the right way to rank those but that's the way zoetis did it so but travis what and and and, and sarah jane what where do you see your herd um down the road that's different from where it is today yeah, I think Lee, that's a that's a great two part answer, and then and and loop that back to carcass merit. You know, I think um, what my success is is as as you know how valuable Jared Watson is. I rely on Jared quite a bit, and we run these numbers through Jared and and really use him as a base. But moving forward, you know, I we we're we're growing, and that that's we're we're going to stop when God tells us to stop growing, but. Um, but right now, boy, five years from now, I would love to have that that unicorn steer calf that takes no maintenance. Um, that's females that are unassisted that they bring a calf home and they weigh a uh, fifty percent or more of their of their body weight. And and but to loop it back to to the carcass merit, and I'm going to turn this over to Sarah Jane. Um, I, I think that's where we're really going to focus the next five years. Uh, something we've kind of we've kind of always kind of dabbled in the direct to consumer market in the last couple of years. It's really growing, and um, just like Stephanie, we kind of started out by feeding out some of our hefferets and and some of our mama cows that were like you shouldn't be a mom anymore. They marbled fabulous for us, um, very tasty, really nice, and um, we've kind of fed some of our calves, and we're looking at doing more of that and so really understanding how you get paid on the rail and and there's a big difference good marbling is worth feeding <laughs> it's worth playing the game and so as we're kind of um starting to dabble with retaining ownership on not just you know feeding out some of our of our kind of our misfits here or there or something but really trying to retain ownership on on potentially a large amount of our calves um I think we're really going to focus on 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 carcass uh, a little, you know, quite a bit more. Yeah, it's a shocking thing. Everybody, I think, as Craig put up early in the presentation on how much marbling affects the dollar feeder index, because mm -hmm. it's it's one of those deals. It, it does cost a little more to feed cattle that are high marbling, but not a lot more. And the premiums we're getting paid today more than justify having them in those categories. And so as as we see it, and as these cattle climb to the upper levels in the index on on feeder and profit they they knock it out of the park on marbling and we sure think that first of all the beef tastes great i mean anybody who eats prime beef is pretty happy with the product uh but but second of all um the the market is paying us for it today and uh, i think it's a great thing and and why not thread the needle i think that's you know i think as people watch the show i mean one of the things you you, you hear is is these are real people doing amazing things with cattle in the real world and, and that's what's exciting about this technology and, and if you listen to the earlier presentation when when bart was talking about how this was probably the biggest change he's seen is the ability for our commercial producers to have this level of information on commercial cattle and to really fine-tune this thing it's uh 
is pretty exciting. And and uh, Sawyer, you've you've probably tested the longest, and I know you mentioned sort of capping out, but I, I don't think people know what that means. Maybe can you explain to them what what that means? And 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 uh, I'm not sure you always capped out. I think that's more of a recent thing on the on the more recent ones, right, Sawyer? Is that accurate? Yeah, the last the last couple years, it's it's yep. really taken off for me, I guess you'd say, and and it 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 is a good percentage of them that are in that higher level. Um, being the cap is not being in profit sharing. Um, you only get to see up to a certain point on how high your your an individual tests, and I think it's twenty five thousand on profit and one twenty on ranch, and and it. I mean, it's a great thing to see until you start <laughs> getting a lot of them, and then you start getting curious. But but what um, but what that what that means so for those of you that are that are maybe not familiar with the inherit test and when it comes back, but what that means is those cattle on the on the ranch index, which is profit from birth through weaning and sell weaning, and then dollar profit, which is the complete cycle if you retained ownership, they're ranking in the top one percent on both those indexes of all commercial cattle and so literally what you're doing is you're moving your herd where the average herd would have the average cow would be a 50th percentile right an average herd with the average cow ranks 50th in, in the way the percentage so now you have all your replacements or a high high percentage of them in the top one percent and that's that's pretty cool and i and i think that's what we sense as seed stock breeders as possible. Um, and th the fact that we can share that technology with commercial customers and get their herds moved in the top 1% is, is kind of just way different than anything we've seen before. And I, I, I didn't, you guys didn't say it, but I think one of the things that we hear a lot about Inherit is the first year we test, we can't believe how high the top ones are and we can't believe how low the bottom ones are. Because before testing, there's this big range. Um, and what testing does is goes back to what you said, Travis. It it lets us tighten that curve up, right? It, it brings them together. We we get that bottom end off and uh it, it really changes things. So and it's a the, the other thing that we all forget is it's an additive thing, right? So it's it's not like you built a big hill and you have to rebuild it every year. You build a big hill and then you build a hill on top of that hill, and it and that's that layering. That gets to where where you're at today, Sawyer, which is with a high percentage of those animals ranking top one percent. And uh, job well done there. Job well done. Well, and and being able to see it come to fruition in the field too is a huge thing. I've I've seen numbers in different associations where you kind of wince and shrug your shoulders. And I I've got a tidbit that uh, my, uh all my efforts. Uh, breeding he or bred heifers this year since calved they pregged 100 percent ai and i didn't believe it at the time um they all have an ai calf on the ground alive at their side at this moment and that how do you get any better and it was the numbers that did it it was chasing it was chasing those indexes that did it that fertility deal yep absolutely well hey guys i told you this would be painless We're, we've we've uh, used up our hour and uh I just can't say thank you enough to all of you coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Um, we, what, what, what you do here and, and, and talking about this really helps open doors for others who haven't tried this technology. And we're, we're obviously excited to share. Uh, if you're listening to this program for the first time, we're uh, talking about the Inherit test from Zoetis. You can contact Zoetis and they'll get you in touch with how to do that, or you can contact us at Leachman Cattle, and, and we can set you up for doing that. If you're a seed stock producer out there wondering about these tools and are interested, um, please call our organization. Um, your contact for that would be Craig Hayes, who's on the call as uh, our expert advisor to seed stock programs on, on using these indexes. And uh, we, do, uh, we do just uh, think we have a great industry and we're making it better. And there's nothing better than uh, being able to make money with our cattle. And we're so fortunate to have the great market we have today. Um, and it gives us an opportunity, I think like maybe no time in recent history to, to really utilize all these technologies and make our cattle better. And so we're excited about that. Thank you guys for coming on and sharing tonight. 
and uh, we'll uh, sign off now. I don't know, Russ, if if we had any written in questions, we'd we'd sure take them. But if not, we'll uh, we are at the the bottom of the hour, so we've used up our our sixty I, I, minutes. I do not have any comments. So. Okay. Well, very good. Well, thank you so much for tonight, you guys. We appreciate it. Good night. Thank you, Lee. Thanks, Lee. Thank you.